Welcome back Highlanders to chapter 4 in our Econ 143 class where we're going to talk about markets, externalities, and public goods. With that in mind, let's go ahead and talk a little bit about what we're going to be getting into this particular chapter. So when we're we'll talking about markets and the social optimum, which is kind of uh, what we talked about in chapter 3. Uh, so a quick review of kind of where we're going to start. And then we're going to talk about how negative externalities are going to impact that market. Uh, we'll first talk about the intuition and some examples of negative externalities. And then we'll go over the theory of negative externalities. That's the graph and math part. And then we'll get into some potential solutions and problems with those solutions. And the solutions that we're going to talk about in this chapter are Pigouvian taxes, the Coase theorem, and well-defined private property rights that are uh, accompanied by regulation. And then from there, we're going to talk a little bit about positive externalities, going through the same ideas, intuition and examples, the theory, which is the graphs and math part, and then pot potential solutions, which in this case would involve subsidies, and again, the problems with those solutions. And then we're going to go into public goods, which are goods that are non-excludable and non-rival consumption. We're going to make sure to carefully define those as compared to other types of goods, talk about the problems that those types of goods pose for the market, and then again, some potential solutions to those particular issues. So that's where we're headed with this chapter. Uh, this chapter is a good combination of kind of some fun examples and uh, fun ideas uh, with uh, the math and graphs that we kind of went over in chapter three. So again, it's a little bit of uh, stuff for everybody in this chapter here. If you're into the intuition behind protecting the environment and how these externalities can affect the market, then this is a good chapter for you. If you're someone who's a big fan of kind of the more theoretical or mathematical applications of economics, then this is also a good chapter for you. Again, we kind of go over both in this one. So let's get into it. All right, so first let's talk a little bit about markets and this idea of the social optimum. So economic theory always starts with this idea of an unregulated, perfectly competitive market that results in the most efficient allocation of resources. So this is kind of the economist dream or what they uh, uh, visualize when they talk about these free markets working in the uh, best possible way for everybody. Now, with this in mind, there is no such thing as dead weight loss where we're in these perfectly unregulated markets. And the idea is that total welfare, which remembers consumer surplus plus uh, producer surplus, is maximized when we're in these uh, unregulated, perfectly competitive markets. Right. So again, there's no dead weight loss and dead weight loss is just a situation where some inefficiency is existing. We're either producing too many products or too few products so that we're not maximizing that total welfare. Right. So again, total welfare, which is our consumer surplus and our producer surplus added together is as big as it can possibly be. Right. If we are in equilibrium in these, uh, again, unregulated and perfectly competitive markets. So let's go ahead and revisit that graph real quick before we start throwing some uh, wrenches into the mechanics of how this market works in the form of these externalities, All right? So let's go ahead and get into it and draw ourselves a market as economists tend to visualize it. So in order to do this, again, we're going to have a vertical axis and a horizontal axis where we're gonna be looking at price being measured on the vertical axis and quantity being measured on that horizontal axis. And then we have this upward sloping supply curve. Remember why it is upward sloping? Because sellers like to sell things at higher prices. The higher the price, the better. They don't like to sell things as much as lower prices. So if the price is lower, they're gonna to try to produce and sell less. If the price is higher, they're gonna to try to produce and sell more. And remember this really represents the marginal cost to that firm of producing things and in this particular chapter, we're going to abbreviate that as the marginal private cost because as we're going to see a little bit later when we start throwing these externalities in there, then it's going to uh, influence this uh, particular curve. So with that in mind, we are also have a downward sloping demand curve in this particular market. Remember why it's downward sloping? Because we as buyers, we like to buy things at low prices. The lower the price, the more eager we are to buy it. At higher prices, we are not nearly as eager to buy this stuff. And again, uh, this represents the marginal benefit to the buyer. And also in this particular chapter, we're going to call it our marginal willingness to pay. Right? Again, it represents the most the buyer is willing to pay for a particular uh, item at, that, at this uh, particular quantity. Right. So again, when these two curves intersect, we get an equilibrium quantity that we call Q star. 
Remember that is where our quantity demanded is equal to our quantity supplied. And then we have an equilibrium price that we call P star, right? And again, that equilibrium price shows us where there's no excess supply or excess demand in this market. And then we have those uh, consumer and producer surplus that we calculated in the last chapter, right? So the area below the demand curve, but above price, this is going to represent consumer surplus. Again, that's the difference between the most the buyer is willing to pay and then the price that they actually pay. And then the area that is above the supply curve, but below price, this represents producer surplus. Again, the difference between the lowest price the seller is willing to accept and the price they actually receive. Okay. And then please remember that our total welfare is equal to that uh, consumer surplus plus that producer surplus or those two added together. All right. So again, that's kind of what we talked about in the last chapter. Now let's go ahead and start messing up this graph or this perfect social uh, optimum or equilibrium that economists dream of with some problems, some very real world problems that do exist and make these uh, uh, economist dreams not turn out the way that they uh, hope to maybe even make them turn into a nightmare. So with that in mind, let's get back to our full screen mode and talk about externalities. So an externality is a cost or benefit that is external, which means it is imposed on those not involved in the transaction or the decision, right? So again, this is a cost or benefit that is external, which means it is imposed on those not involved in the transaction or decision. So give you a couple examples. When we talk about an external cost, an example of that might involve this idea of when you choose to smoke. Now, economists, again, assume people are rational, meaning that when you're making the decision to smoke, then you've hopefully carefully weighed the uh, benefits and costs of smoking, right? So for whatever reason, if you chose to smoke because you like the way that smoking makes you look or you like the way it makes you feel, gives you that nice, cool, relaxed feeling, right? And to you, that outweighs any potential negative health side effects that come along with smoking. And so you say, hey, benefits outweigh the cost of me. I'm going to smoke. Well, economist says, as long as you've carefully considered the benefits and costs of smoking and you still choose to smoke, well, it's rational for you to make that decision. Smoke on. Right. Having said that, though, as soon as you start blowing your secondhand smoke into somebody else's face, well, you're creating a problem for somebody who is outside of your decision. To, uh, to engage in smoking, All right? So I'll give you a, a kind of quick story about how addicted some people are to smoking. So back when uh, uh, I was a young graduate student working on my PhD in economics, I was diagnosed with cancer and I had to go to a hospital to get chemotherapy. So they sat me in a chair across from some other people sitting in chairs. We're all getting our chemotherapy for some form of cancer. And it's kind of like if you're ever in prison, you kind of look at, uh, across the uh, cell there to the person across from you and say, hey, what are you in for, right? Well, as it turns out, the person across from me was in there for lung cancer. Uh, he had been a smoker his whole life. He'd been smoking since I think he was like 12 or 13 years old. So he's sitting there again as chemotherapy for lung cancer. Now, every once in a while, he would unplug his IV pole that was delivering his chemotherapy because it would still run on batteries for a couple hours. And he'd wheel it outside the hospital so that he could keep on smoking while receiving his chemotherapy for lung cancer. So he came back into the uh, uh, room there where I was sitting and asked him where he was. And he told me that that's what he was doing. And I was like, dude, you're getting chemotherapy for lung cancer. You need to make some changes. And he's like, ah, I don't know. I enjoy smoking, right? I already have lung cancer. The worst thing that can happen to somebody from smoking has already happened, right? I enjoy smoking enough to keep on smoking. So I'm going to keep on doing it, right? Now, when he said that to me, there's nothing I could tell him except for, yeah, go ahead, smoke on. As long as he's not blowing his smoke in my face, he's not creating a problem for me. He's not creating that negative externality. So as long as he wheels his IV pole outside the hospital to smoke where there's nobody around, right, then he's free to make that decision without necessarily negatively impacting me or the world. Now, when he, you know, if he chose to smoke inside the hospital room and then blew that smoke into my face, well, then now he's sharing all the negative effects of smoking with me, and I'm not getting any of those positive effects and so he's creating a native externality for me, right? He's making me worse off uh, by doing something, and I wasn't involved in that decision of his to do it, 
right? So again, that's the idea of an external cost or what we call a negative externality, but not all ne externalities are bad. You can have what's known as a positive externality. For example, if you participate in some kind of beach cleanup, right, you're going through all the effort to clean up the beach, but you do get the beauty of having a nice clean beach to play on and look at. Now, everybody else who did not participate in that uh, uh, beach cleanup, they also get the beauty of a nice clean beach to play on or look at without having to do any of the work. So again, they weren't involved in your decision to go out there and clean up the beach, yet they still benefit from it. So again, your actions can create a positive externality for somebody else or an external benefit that makes them better off without them being involved in that particular transaction or decision. All right. So again, just real quick to kind of illustrate how these externalities work. As an economist, you have an individual who makes a decision, hopefully because the marginal benefits of that decision outweigh the marginal cost. We say that when individuals are making decisions to do something, again, we've assumed they've considered those benefits and costs at least enough to make that decision. And generally speaking, again, as long as the benefits outweigh the cost, we say it's rational for them to make that decision. So it makes them better off. Now, in the case of an externality, what's happening is that that decision isn't just influencing them. That decision is influencing some third party, or it could even be a group of third party individuals. Now, that decision could influence them in a way to make them better off, as in the case of a positive externality, like that beach cleanup, or your decision, like in the case of, say, secondhand smoke, could influence them in such a way to make them worse off. Again, they have no part in your decision to do this thing. They only experience these external effects, whether they be positive or negative. Now, another pot uh, potential example of how this works is it might not just be you as part of the decision. It might be you and somebody else engaged in a transaction. For example, if you were to shop at a company that is known for polluting the nearby river, then you and the company are going to engage in this transaction. Say the CEO of that company is female. This is the only way I can denote my artistic ability to denote females versus males, by the way. Uh, so again, you and the uh, uh, owners or workers of this company engage in these transactions uh, in such a way that, again, you both expect to be made better off. So when you buy something from this company, you wanted the something that you bought more than the money you paid. So again, you're better off from this transaction. The company wants your money more than the product they sold you. So they're better off as a result of this transaction, right? Both you and the company are happy this transaction takes place. But as long as you're supporting this company that's polluting the uh, nearby river, then anybody who uses that river but isn't necessarily somebody who supports that company, they're affected by that transaction because now they have to deal with that pollution, right? So again, you're better off because you get the product cheaper from this company, even though you, do, you might have to also deal with the polluted river, right? The company itself is um, better off because, again, they get to uh, produce the product for cheaper while polluting the river and, um, again, get the benefit of having your money, right? But the third-party person involved here, they are made worse off by this transaction because now all they have is the polluted river. They didn't get to benefit from the lower prices or from the lower costs like the company did, right? So with that in mind, again, you can have a transaction that makes the third party worse off. You can also have a transaction that makes a third party better off. For example, if you decide to go get a flu vaccination, right? So you decide that the, bene the marginal benefits of getting the flu vaccination outweigh the marginal cost of getting that vaccination, then again, you're better off for getting that vaccination. The hospital or doctor that you bought that vaccination from, they're better off because again, they want to give you the flu vaccination as well and get paid to do so. So they both benefit from that transaction. Now, some third-party person who had no decision in you becoming vaccinated from the flu, they're also made better off by your decision to get vaccinated because that's one less person they can catch the flu from. So even if they choose not to get vaccinated, if you don't have the flu, you can't give them the flu. So they're made better off by your decision to get that flu vaccination. So again, a transaction can make a uh, third person better off, even though they had no say in that uh, decision or transaction, right, through that positive external benefit, right? So that's, again, kind of how these uh, externalities are illustrated. Let's go ahead and talk a little bit about how it's kind of explained in words because I do really want you all to get this idea. Uh, I want you to make sure that we don't have it uh, twisted here. So when it comes to a negative externality, 
the producer of this negative externality, they do get the cost of this activity. Like if they choose to smoke, they do have to deal with the negative health side effects of smoking. If they choose to uh, pollute the river or frequent a company that does pollute a river, they do also have to deal with that pollution, right? So in other words, the producer gets the benefits and the costs. Just like everybody does with any decision that they make, right? However, if the benefits outweigh the cost to the producer, then the producer is going to say, yeah, let's go ahead and make this happen. Now, the problem in terms of what makes this a negative externality is that everybody else, they only get the cost, right? If you get that secondhand smoke, you don't get the benefits of that cool, relaxed feeling from smoking if, if you're not a smoker, right? You only get the negative health side effects that comes with that secondhand smoke. Again, if you don't frequent the company, you don't get the benefit from the lower prices or the lower costs that will increase your profits. You only get the pollution in the river, right? So because the producers get both the benefits and the costs, they're going to be more likely to do this activity than um, the, everybody else who only experienced the costs want them to actually do it, right? So in other words, when this comes around, there's going to be too much of this negative externality out there, right? So there's too much secondhand smoke, there's too much pollution, there's too much of these uh, negative exter externalities or bad things, right? Uh, so I'll give you a couple of examples. Again, uh, stories kind of from my childhood is that uh, I used to do a lot of boxing in high school and my mother uh, almost never came to watch me box. Like she refused to come and watch me uh, engage in that sport. She came to uh, any of my like soccer games when I played soccer. She came to my basketball games when I used to play basketball. But when I got into boxing, she never came to them. And I asked her one day, I was like, how come you never come to my boxing matches? And she said, well, Joe, it's because uh, I, like, I know you love boxing. I know you love the athleticism and the competition, and it's fun for you to get in that ring. But every time you get hit, it feels like I get hit too. And I was like, wow, Mom, that really sucks. Because, like she just pointed out, I get the benefits of boxing. I get, the uh, again, the increased athleticism, the, uh, the feelings of competition, the joy of being in that uh, competitive environment. Now, I do get the cost of getting punched in the face, but for me, the benefits outweighed the cost, so uh, it was something that I would uh, continue to pursue. However, for my mom, she only got those punches to the face or the feelings of them, right? In other words, she only got the cost, so I always did more boxing than my mother wanted me to. If you've ever had to uh, watch or babysit little uh, children, you'll notice that little children like to do things like uh, play on the edge of staircases or engage in things where they might hurt themselves because, again, there's some joy in, uh, to them for doing that. Like they get the benefits of uh, whatever exhilaration they feel playing on the edge of a staircase, right? Now, they also get the cost of that potential injury if they fall and hurt themselves. Now, you, on the other hand, when you're responsible for watching those children, you don't get that exhilaration of them playing near the edge of the staircase. That's not fun for you. You only get that dread or the cost of them falling and hurting themselves, which is why children will always play near the edge of more staircases than you want them to. So there's always going to be more or too much of this negative externality out there than you'd like there to be. When it comes to a positive externality, again, the same story is true for the producer. The producer gets both the benefits and the costs. So the producer of this externality gets both the benefits and the costs. Now, if the costs outweigh the benefit to the producer, then they're going to choose not to engage in this particular activity. And that's troubling for everybody else because everybody else only gets the benefits. Again, if you choose to go and get vaccinated from the flu, then you've got to suffer the cost of paying for that vaccination, going down there to the hospital and sitting around all those sick, pe uh, sick people and then waiting for that flu shot and then that painful injection. Uh, you do get the benefits of uh, less uh, or lower chance of getting the flu that year, but everybody else, they only get the benefits of the lower chance of getting the flu from you. They don't have to suffer the cost when you choose to get the flu vaccination which is why there's never going to be enough people out there getting vaccinated from the flu as we'd like there to be, particularly now or in our recent history, right? So the problem with these positive externalities or the problem they pose for the market is that there's too few or too little of this stuff out there, right? It's uh, There's not enough out there uh, to um, satisfy what everybody else would like there to be, right? So again, too little or too few of these positive externalities 
are uh, out there, right? So again, just like in the same way that there's uh, too much secondhand smoke and pollution, there's too few vac uh, flu vaccinations or people out there cleaning up the beach. All right. So that is uh, kind of the essence of externalities and what they uh, represent. So let's go ahead and talk about some real life examples here, even though we kind of already mentioned a few. So when it comes to um, external costs, again, these are costs that are imposed on someone other than the producer of that negative externality. And an example I have of that is this paper mill in Luke, Maryland, right? So I don't know if anybody's ever been around a paper mill before, but it's uh, pretty amazing the smell that a paper mill creates. So paper mills do a lot of polluting, the first of which would be the air pollution and the foul smell created as a byproduct of its production. I'm not exactly sure what creates that smell. I know that trees don't have that smell, and I don't know that paper, and I know that paper doesn't have that smell, but somewhere in the process of trees becoming paper, this smell is created uh, from the uh, usage of these chemicals. Now, uh, there's also some water pollution that uh, has a negative impact on any organisms downstream and makes the uh, river less desirable for recreational purposes. So whenever we this paper mill uh, produces um, this paper, right, it creates sludge that ends up in that downtown river. And again, these costs are incurred by the people who live in Loop, Maryland, right? In the sense that if you are not working at this paper mill, if you are not um, the owner of this paper mill, or if you're not somebody who's buying paper from this paper mill, again, you're not getting any of the benefits of this paper mill being there, but you are getting the cost of this foul-smelling air and, again, this uh, sludge and uh, uh, other types of pollution that ends up in the environment. Now, um, these external costs are external in the sense that they aren't really considered too much by the company in the sense that they aren't on the company's bottom line. In other words, if they can produce products cheaper by polluting, it will help their bottom line to do so. Because uh, this pollution is uh, coming from this factory, again, it does affect everyone around the factory, but the owners of the factory, when evaluating their profits, right, aren't necessarily going to consider these external costs. I will say this, though. Uh, the people who work for Loop Maryland and the people who are around in that community do say that the company does try to make up for it, one, by offering jobs with uh, well above average wages, that kind of helps pump money into the community. They also do a lot of community outreach to the local schools and things like that. So again, I wouldn't kind of classify this as an evil company just because they're creating pollution. That does hurt the people in Luke, Maryland because they are creating a lot of good things, particularly for the people who are working there or if you're buying paper or again, if you are benefiting from some of their community outreach projects. Right? So again, there are costs and benefits and trade-offs either way, but this is an example of some external costs that are being created as a result of this company's production. All right, so let's watch a quick video clip here uh, with another example of a negative externality. This one involves uh, the creation of whistle tips, which is a device that gets welded into the muffler of a car that can make the car uh, audible for miles. So you can kind of hear this loud screeching sound as the car drives by. It's kind of a fad that existed for a while, uh, particularly up in uh, Northern California and Oakland, I believe is where it was started. And that's where this news clip is uh, uh, shot. So let's go ahead and take a quick look at this video. I want to see if you can pick out uh, the negative externalities involved. Of course, the whistler tip is the easy one. Let's see if you can pick out any others. The latest rage for kids is driving parents and entire neighborhoods crazy. It's called a whistle tip, and it's welded inside a car's muffler to make the car screechingly loud for nearly a mile. Well, tomorrow night, Oakland residents will be complaining officially to City Hall officials. Crown Force Mark Jones has the story live in Oakland this evening. Mark. Well, Pam, city residents have been told this noise is perfectly legal, so tomorrow they hope to start the process to change the law. Nearly every muffler shop in Oakland is installing Whistler tips. It's a piece of metal welded inside the exhaust pipes that makes the car audible for almost a mile. Tell me about the whistles. The whistles go woo! Anybody that has it in their neighborhood is going to be totally driven crazy. Roxanne Brun says the high-pitched tone, like the squeal of a bar train that doesn't stop, is keeping her awake at night. Police have told her it is legal. They think it's a fad, it's going to go away, it's not going away. <laughs> and it's driving you nuts. It's driving me nuts. I work at home. Uh, 
I can't concentrate when it goes on for, for you know, hours. Some neighbors, some neighbors are saying way too loud. That's only in the morning. You're supposed to be up cooking breakfast or somebody, and so that's like an alarm clock. Woo woo! Bub Rub and Little Sis were proud to show it off. Some Oakland residents will complain about the noisemakers Tuesday night at the city council meeting. Until the law changes, Marcelo Cabrera says he will keep installing them. We don't want it in your neighborhood? No, I won't. I won't. But that's what they want. And, you know, my business is sell the pipe, so I have to sell whatever they want. And whatever people want, I'll sell it. <laughs> An AC Transit bus driver told us the noise is so loud you can't even hear the siren from an approaching ambulance. So far, they've caused no known accidents. In Oakland, Mark Jones, Cron 4 News. All right, so in looking at that clip, obviously you can see that those uh, whistler tips are a negative externality in the sense that the people who install those on those car and, and their cars, they get the benefit from it in terms of creating that loud screeching noise. They also have to deal with that particular loud screeching noise as you can uh, see from the clip, one of the owners even said that he wouldn't want it in his neighborhood, but his job is to sell what people want. So if they come in and want that uh, Whistler tip, then he's going to have to put it in. So again, they get the benefits and the costs, but the benefits are where they cost, whether they're the person who gets it installed or whether they're the person who sells it to somebody else, then they're going to go ahead and make it happen. Now, everybody else, they only have to deal with the, or they, all they get are the costs that they do have to deal with of that loud screeching sound. And of course, is that negative externality, right? So those are the external costs being created by that particular item. Now, there was another negative externality in that clip. Hopefully, you can pick it out. When Bub Rub and Little Sis were interested in showing that off, right? They're driving all over both sides of the road and blowing through stop signs and things like that. Bad and inconsiderate driving like that is certainly a negative externality. Yeah, you get the risk of being in an accident, so you deal with the cost. You also get the benefit of driving how you like. Everybody else, however, they only get the cost of, again, having to deal with that potential accident that you're going to create. All right, so those are some examples of negative externalities from that video that should be pretty easy to pick out. All right, so I'm sure you can think of some examples of negative externalities from your own lives as well. Uh, but we're going to go ahead and continue on and talk a little bit about this idea of social cost, which is equal to the private cost plus these external costs that we've just been talking about. Right, so the private cost to a company, like we talked about with, uh, uh, say, maybe Luke Maryland and this uh, paper mill that's uh, producing the paper that causes this uh, all this uh, pollution and foul-smelling air as a byproduct. The private cost would be the things like the labor or the machines, the energy, all the things that are going to go on their uh, uh, balance sheet, right? Their uh, income statements and things like that. So whenever they pay employees, whenever they buy machines to produce the paper. Uh, whenever they pay their electric bill or their business taxes, these are all the private costs. Now, the things like the sludge that gets dumped into the river, or the foul-smelling air, that is the external cost. And so if you add the private cost to the external cost, then you get what is known as the social cost. Now, remember, in economics, we tend to think at the margin. And so we're going to really consider this idea of marginal social cost, which is the cost to everybody, not just the company, but the entire environment as well of producing one more unit. And that's equal to the marginal private cost, which is the cost to the company of producing one more unit, plus the marginal external cost, which is the cost to everybody else, the, the, both the company and everybody else in the environment of producing one more unit. And so with that in mind, um, know that if the output levels are low or the company is not producing a lot, then the marginal external cost is also going to be fairly low. But if the company is producing a lot or their output levels are high, then that marginal external cost is likely to be high as well. So that marginal external cost is something that tends to increase with output. So let's go ahead and graph that out and talk a little bit about what that might look like on a graph. So again, let's go ahead and exit our full screen mode so we can use some different colors here. So if we're going to graph out our marginal external cost, and just so you know, we're going to do about two. We're going to do two graphs side by side here in your notes. So if you are taking notes there, follow along with this video at home or wherever you like to watch these. And again, in your uh, notebook, go ahead and put two graphs side by side. So we're going to be measuring these costs in dollars over here on the vertical axis. And then we're going to be measuring quantity here on the horizontal axis in both cases. 
All right, so this first graph, we're just going to graph out our marginal external cost curve. Now, it could be the case, again, because of things like the assimilative capacity of the environment, and that definition we talked about in Chapter 2, that somewhere between, say, 0 and we'll call this point uh, Q hat, So somewhere between zero and Q hat, you might not experience any marginal external costs at all. Meaning that whatever uh, side effects of production that you have happening there in terms of maybe pollution or sludge that you're dumping into the river, right? The assimilative capacity of the environment can handle it, right? So your marginal external cost curve might look like something like this, where again, it's, uh, it's uh, nowhere to be found or zero all the way up till Q hat. And then once we get to Q hat, you're going to start seeing some marginal external costs that are going to increase with every unit that you produce, right? So every uh, unit you produce past Q hat, you're adding some more pollution into the environment. So, again, if we're looking at the uh, marginal cost curve of the firm, remember that's the curve from which the uh, supply curve is uh, derived. Again, this is uh, what we call the marginal cost, which... We've kind of renamed for the purposes of this chapter as our marginal private cost or the cost of the company of producing these things. Again, between zero and Q hat, that marginal private cost is going to be the same as our marginal social cost because our marginal external cost is zero. Again, anywhere between the production levels of zero and Q hat. But once you get past Q hat, you're going to see that those marginal external costs are going to start making our marginal social costs look a little bit different. So this curve is going to start to ramp up looking something like this. And this is our marginal social cost curve, which, remember, is equal to our marginal private cost plus that marginal external cost. Right. So if we choose a quantity, we'll say that quantity is uh, called Q1 right here. So however much we're producing here at Q1, the difference between that marginal private cost curve and that marginal social cost curve, in other words, that gap there, that is going to be equal to our marginal external cost at Q1. All right. Now, if we're producing a greater quantity, we'll say Q2 over here. Then again, where that Q2 hits our marginal private cost curve, and then where it hits our marginal social cost curve, I have to extend that a little there. Right, again, that difference or that gap, that is our marginal external cost at Q2. So notice that that gap is uh, bigger the more we produce because those marginal external costs increase as we produce more and more. Right. So again, that is what the uh, marginal social cost curve looks like. It's your marginal private cost plus your marginal external cost. So as soon as those marginal external costs are kicking in, that marginal social cost curve is going to be different than that marginal private cost curve. And the difference between your marginal private cost curve and your marginal social cost curve is what we call those marginal external costs. All right. All right. So again, that's what that graph looks like. That's kind of how you graph out those marginal external costs and how it influences our marginal private costs, or again, what is known as that supply curve in our supply and demand graph. So again, when negative externalities are present, the market equilibrium will not be the same as the socially efficient outcome or that socially efficient equilibrium that we explored at the very beginning of this chapter and back in chapter three, all right? So again, another example of a negative externality might be if somebody's walking around outside without a mask in this uh, coronavirus uh, pandemic or outbreak that we are uh, currently uh, living through, right? If that's the case, then uh, again, they might be creating a negative externality on other people. Again, they get the benefit of not wearing the mask. They also have to deal with the cost. Everybody else only has to deal with the cost, right? So in this case, right, the market will produce too much or create what we know at, or what is known as dead weight loss, which, again, is a huge problem for the economists, right? We like those markets that are perfectly efficient without this dead weight loss being in it. But unfortunately, this is a byproduct of these negative externalities. So let's go ahead and graph that out. So 
So once again, we're going to do two graphs side by side so you can kind of see where this stuff comes from. So again, if you're following along with your notes at home, you want to draw two of these big L's right next to each other. All right, so we got, again, we're going to be measuring our costs over here in dollars and quantity. Then over here with this graph, we're going to have price and quantity. So we talk about how this equilibrium is going to be affected by this um, negative externality. So you might have a marginal external cost that is constant, meaning that every unit you produce, it might create, say, $10 worth of marginal external costs. So in other words, this could be your marginal external cost curve here. So again, every unit you produce produces the uh, same $10 and um, external costs to say the public or environment. So you might have a supply curve that looks like this. Again, this supply curve represents our marginal private cost. And then you have a demand curve that's downward sloping, looking something like this. All right. And this is what we call our market equilibrium. So we're going to uh, abbreviate that with E superscript M. And this is going to give us our equilibrium quantity. We call that Q superscript M. And our equilibrium price, P superscript M. Right. Now, this is, again, our marginal private cost. Right, but in this particular world, now we have a negative externality that is $10 per unit. So what that's going to do is it's going to create a parallel shift that is exactly uh, $10 higher. So again, wherever this uh, supply curve originally started, this new supply curve is going to start $10 higher than that. And this is what is known as our marginal social cost curve. This is our marginal private cost curve plus that marginal external cost which is, again, $10 uh, in every unit that gets produced. Right. In other words, if we were to take into account that this company, like the Luke Maryland Paper Mill, is producing pollution so that every package of paper they make creates an extra $10 worth of damage to the environment, then this is where we really like this equilibrium to be. In other words, this is going to be what we call the socially efficient equilibrium, where we got Q star... And then the socially equilibrium price that we would prefer there to be, right, that is socially optimal equilibrium price, P star, right? So as you notice here, right, that the market equilibrium is where we actually are. In other words, that's how much is actually being produced and the price that is actually being charged. But once you take into account these marginal external costs, then we say that this company here uh, is producing these uh, too much of this particular item at a price that's too low. In other words, these, uh, following along with the socially equilibrium or the social equilibrium that we just uh, uh, graphed out here, right? we would love to pay more for this particular product if it got rid of these uh, marginal external costs and produce less of this particular item. So in other words, we have a price here that is too low. And that... The socially optimal price is P star, but we're really operating at a price of uh, PEM there. So again, the price is lower than we'd like it to be. we love it if this paper sold for more so that people would buy less of it, so that people would be producing less of it and creating less of this negative externality. And we have a quantity here that is too high. In other words, we are producing too much. Because society wants to be, again, producing at Q star, given that these, this production will create these negative external costs. But the uh, company itself, and maybe its customers, would like it to produce at QM, right? Again, uh, not taking into account the fact that they are creating these negative external costs to everybody else. Right. So, again, when it comes down to it, society, in terms of you taking into account everybody, wants to be at E star, right? That's where society would love to be. That's where the socially optimal equilibrium. 
but the market itself doesn't take into account these external costs or what society wants as much as what the company and customers want. And so the market is currently at EM, right? So again, the market is currently producing thing uh, too much of something and charging a price that society deems too low, given that we want people to do less of this stuff, right? So again, that's kind of how a negative externality is affecting our market or disrupting that social optimum, right? Again, if it was a, uh, a perfectly competitive uh, market or a socially optimum market that economists love or that we talked about here at the beginning of chapter three, then we'd be at E star, but unfortunately, because this market includes this negative external costs, we are operating at EM. All right, so let's go ahead and move on and talk about another example of a negative externality, and that is in the market for tuna. So catching tuna often has a negative external effect in terms of an unintentional reduction of the dolphin population. For anybody out there who uh, goes out, who uh, buys tuna, you know that you can buy what's known as dolphin safe tuna, which adheres to uh, special uh, tuna catching regulations that help that may help mitigate this external negative effect. Although it has been questionable how effective those regulations uh, have been in the past, right? Uh, so uh, those regulations have been uh, getting increasingly tougher. And if you're interested in that, there's an additional reading located about it on uh, iLearn for you. But uh, for now, let's go ahead and say that this uh, uh, tuna catching is reducing the dolphin population. And let's go ahead and provide some numbers. So again, I'm going to come up with some theoretical demand and supply curves here. So again, let's say that demand is uh, where uh, price is equal to 1,000 minus eight quantity demanded. Again, even if I didn't tell you that that was quantity demanded, you should know that's the demand curve from the inverse relationship between quantity and price. And then supply is 100 plus quantity supplied. Again, even if I didn't tell you that was quantity supplied, but just quantity, you should know that is the supply curve from the direct relationship between price and quantity. And so let's go ahead and start doing some math here in order to uh, graph out this particular curve or uh, market. So with that in mind, say that we got this vertical axis here, this horizontal axis here, we got price and quantity. And now we need to start drawing in these demand and supply curves. So remember, we can't just draw them in anywhere when we have these equations. We got to figure out where the uh, y and x intercept are. So if you want to figure out the what we call demand choke price or the price at which people won't buy any, then you have to set QD equal to zero. So if we do set QD equal to zero, then we know that our demand curve chokes off at a price of $1,000 or that's our y-intercept for that demand curve, right? So we have a price of 1,000. That's where we know this demand curve is going to start. We know we have a steep downward sloping demand curve looking something like that. Now, if we want to figure out where it hits the x-axis, then you just have to set our price, or p, equal to 0, and then solve for QD. So if we set price equal to 0, then we have uh, eight quantity demanded equal to a thousand, so that our quantity demanded, or solving for quantity demanded, uh, gives us one twenty-five. So that's our demand curve. Now again, if we want to see where our supply curve is going to start, then all we got to do is set quantity supplied equal to zero. And in doing that, we can see that the supply curve is going to start at 100. So again, our supply choke price, or the lowest price that uh, people won't be willing to be, will be uh, willing to produce anything at, is going to be at 100. Right. So again, you might also want to take note of the fact that that demand curve is going to be a lot steeper than that supply curve. So we're going to have a relatively flat supply curve starting off at 100. maybe looking something like this and this gives us a market equilibrium so in other words this is where the market currently is so we'll call that em and again this is going to be our qm and our market equilibrium price here 
And we can actually calculate that out, if you remember how to do so, by setting that uh, demand and su supply equation equal to each other, right? So again, if we want to calculate out this equilibrium, then we just say 1,000 minus 8Q is equal to 100 plus Q. Again, this is our market equilibrium that we are calculating here. And then we just uh, get our Qs to one side. So uh, we subtract 100 over to the other side. So 1,000 minus 100 is 900. Over here, we just add 8Q over to the other side. So that is 9Q, right? So we know that Q is equal to 100. And again, this is our QM here. So we know that our market is currently producing 100 units of tuna. And if we wanted to figure out what that price would be, again, we just plug that 100 into either of these equations. Either way, you should get it right. So P equals 1,000 minus 8 times 100 is equal to 200. Or you can also do P is equal to 100 plus 100 plugging our 100 in for QS because remember QD and QS should be the same in that market equilibrium and that gives you that equilibrium price of 200. All right, so that's a quick review from chapter three. Remember we uh, learned how to calculate out that market equilibrium. Now say though, uh, this is where things get a little bit uh, new. Let's say that there is a total external cost In this tuna market, uh, uh, the external cost being, again, the unintentional killing of dolphins, that is equivalent to 180Q. Right? Well, again, what we're really focused here on here, or what we really want to figure out, is the marginal external cost. And the marginal external cost is just equal to the derivative of the total external cost with respect to Q which is just 180, right? So again, to keep things simple, we're gonna have a pretty constant marginal external uh, cost uh, of 180, right? So again, this supply curve is equal to our marginal private cost, right? Well, now we're gonna throw in the fact that we, are, uh, that we also have a marginal external cost equal to 180 in this market. And basically what that's going to do is that is going to raise that supply curve or shift it to the left in such a way that it is exactly 180 higher than it was, uh, than where it started, right? So you're gonna have a supply curve look something like this. So this supply curve now represents our uh, marginal social cost. I'm starting to get ugly. Which if you remember is just the marginal private cost plus that marginal external cost, which we just calculated out as 180, right? So in other words, this supply curve we know is going to start here at 280, because we know it's gonna start $180 higher than our original supply curve, given that it is just our original supply curve with 180 added to it. And where that intersects the original demand curve, that's gonna be our socially optimal equilibrium, or again, where society would like us to be, given the fact that this market does create this uh, negative external effect. And so this is gonna be our Q star and our price P star. All right, so with that in mind, we can calculate out again what those equilibrium quantity and prices are by setting our demand equal to our marginal social cost. So when we're calculating out E star, and again, we're gonna set demand equal to marginal social cost now, right? So our demand equation hasn't changed. That's still 1,000 minus 8Q, and that's gonna be equal to our original uh, supply curve of 100 plus Q plus our marginal external cost, which is equal to 180, right? So that's 1,000 minus 8Q equal to 280 plus Q. 
And again, if we move all these terms to uh, uh, one side, so we move the 8q over to the other side, right, then we're going to get 9q over here. And if we subtract 280 to the other side, then you should get 720 over here. So we know that our q star is equal to 720 divided by 9, which is 80. So true to what we said earlier, the private market is definitely producing more than what our socially optimal equilibrium would be. Right? Again, we're producing 100 units where we'd much rather just have 80 units out there, given the fact that, again, this has this negative external effect of killing these dolphins. Now, once again, we can plug that 80 into our uh, prices uh, uh, in order to figure out what that P star is. So again, P is equal to... 1,000 minus 8 times 80, which is 1,000 minus 640, which gives you 360. Or you can plug it into your marginal social cost curve. So again, that is equal to 280 plus Q. The 280 plus, and then we calculate that Q out to be 80. Again, that should give you 360. All right from there we can definitely see what our p star is again i always recommend doing it uh twice just to make sure you got it right all right so the last thing we're going to talk about is uh exactly how much damage is this causing to the environment uh or exactly how much uh, inefficiency is this creating and we can actually calculate that out and what's known as that again that dead weight loss right so again the problem is is that we have too many transactions Again, we should only have 80, but we have 100, so we got 20 extra transactions here, right? And so, again, we can kind of figure out what our um, dead weight loss is by figuring out what is the damage caused by these extra 20 transactions. So, the real problem is that these transactions exist, whereas they shouldn't if you're counting in the fact that these uh, marginal external costs exist. Right, so this is what we call our dead weight loss, which I'll just abbreviate as DWL. Right, so that dead weight loss represents the fact that, again, there's 20 more transactions out there than society would like. When you count the marginal external cost, the cost of any transactions beyond E star outweigh the benefit of those transactions, which are given by the demand curve. Actually, forgot the label here. Right, and so as you can see, this dead weight loss is being created. Right, so let's go ahead and calculate out what this dead weight loss actually is. Right, so dead weight loss is equal to the area of that triangle, which is one half base times height. So that's equal to one half, and we know the base of that triangle, that is just the difference in the number of transactions there, which are 20. Now, as far as the height of that triangle is concerned, uh, there's a couple ways that you can do it. Made an error mark there. One way that you can do it is that you can plug that 100 into your marginal social cost curve in order to get where this uh, point here uh, hits that uh, marginal social cost curve, right? So in other words, remember that our MSC is equal to 280 plus Q. So our MSC at QM equals 100 is 280 plus 100, which is equal to 380. And you can plug that number in here in order to figure out that the height of the triangle is the difference between that 380 and 200, which is PM, which is 180. Or you can also just remember that our marginal social cost curve is exactly 180 higher than our marginal private cost curve, and that will also give you the height of that triangle. Again, either way you do it, you should get the correct answer. So this is 1 half of 20 times 80, which is equal to 1 half of 3,600, which is equal to 1800 and that is the dead weight loss that's being created by all these transactions that are up and above what society would like given that these marginal external costs are create are being created 
and the uh, tuna market, right? So with that in mind, on the exam, be able to calculate where the market equilibrium is, where the socially optimal equilibrium is, and the dead weight loss that is being created. All right, so that is going to be all for this particular lecture. Uh, I think we've uh, covered, covered quite a bit here in part one. Uh, come back for the next video, and we're going to get started on the potential solutions to negative externalities, starting off with this idea of a Pigouvian tax. Right, so we've gone over what externalities are and the problems created by negative externalities. Next video, we'll start talking about the solutions to negative externalities. So with that in mind, if you have any questions about how to do any of this math or, when, or how to um, understand or interpret what these externalities are, then please feel free to come see me during my uh, Zoom office hours or shoot me an email, and I'll be more than happy to help you. All right, so until then, just let me know if you need anything. I uh, hope the class is going well. And take care.